Hi, this is Dr. Carl Ackerman with History is Here to Help. I am the host today, and I am so grateful because we have the wonderful uh, Tepi Wise here as the Chief Business Officer of Kanu on the Big Island, which is a absolutely glorious and wonderful charter school. And I want to ask her questions today about this lovely, lovely school. And here we go. Good morning, Kathy. So glad you could be here. Hello, Carl. Thanks for having me. And you know, let me start off with a with a um, uh, you know, a question that you know when I started reading about your school came to the forefront pretty quickly. And what's your goal or your overall you know message that you want to give to our audience about what you do um, on the Big Island in, in that lovely town of Tamuela, and as I just mentioned to you, with lovely restaurants. Too. Yeah, yes. I think the uh, goal of Kanaokaina is to allow each and every individual student and adult to reach their highest potential. Kulei Kanu is our motto, um, empowering people through a holistic and academic lens that is culturally grounded, that reminds them of where they come from, that surrounds them in traditional Hawaiian values and and a culture of uh, that's reminiscent of the old days where it takes a family to raise a child is really what we strive to do. Not really meaning to dictate a path for any child, but more to open the doors to any path that's that's there by seating them in and where they come from. You know, you mentioned, you know, about traditional values. And what I noticed having visited your school on OWASP committee uh, was that every day begins uh, with a large circle of uh, all your entire community. And can you describe that ceremony? Because I think it really settles kids, you know, kids that mm -hmm. are, that are, you know, you know, it seems like they're barely able to talk. They're so little yeah. um, all yeah. the way up to the kapuna who have gray beards and gray hair like me. Yeah, so, so we call it protocol or PICO every morning. Um, even the orientation of the campus, we built it backwards. So the orientation of the middle of the school where the PICO is facing Mauna Kea. So when the children stand and face the east, they're looking at the summit. Um, many of our children and our families are economically disadvantaged. It, it's, it's a hard life, a rancher life, a rural life. Um, so when they come every day to school, we want them to leave behind what, what maybe wasn't a good morning and to start the day anew. The chanting raises their vibration, puts everybody on the same page, honors nature and, and grounds them for the day. Um, it also tries to put everybody on the same page that we are here privileged to learn and to share and to honor our values and that that's what's expected once they come to campus. And the, the teachers and the kumu and the staff and the principals and the kids all the way from pre-kindergarten, three years old to the 18 year old senior um, engage in that, in that activity every day. That's, that's uh, you know, that's different than most schools mm -hmm. and most public schools. And, you know, you're a, a wonderful charter school. So, you know, I think people are always interested, um, and this would be great from your perspective, what's the difference between, you know, a public school and a charter school? And um, how does that affect your funding, uh, for example? Uh, charter school is a school of choice. Um, there's two types of charter schools, a conversion, which is where it was a traditional DOE school that was converted, and then a startup, which kind of kind of is which means that the community came together and appealed to the Department of Ed and the Board of Ed to engage in community education. So the ideology and the epistemology of delivery is our own and very unique to what we proposed, which was through culture and language and history of Hawaii. Um, but we all have to reach the same goals as far as academic progress um, for public education in Hawaii. The economics is very, very different. Um, 
a traditional public school child will receive anywhere from 17 to 18,000 a student um, for all services combined. And a charter school student this year received about nine. Um, and that excludes facilities, food, and transportation. So the economics of charters is difficult, to be honest. Um, we need to fundraise, rate grants, scramble, get partners uh, to, to run every year. Um, you had mentioned um, that, you know, it's a school of choice. And so based on your curriculum, what makes uh, families want to come to um, your school? And of course, I'm going to ask you a, a subsequent question. This is a tangent in just a minute based on this. Um, I, well, one, they love the facility, um, but then they have to realize that everything is balanced through the Hawaiian culture. It's not trickled in on top. It's the basis and the grounding for what we do. It's a more kinesthetic learning style, so more hands-on, um, more actionable in the way that uh, projects that the kids engage in are really relevant to this community, what's going on in our community um, with our families, for example, Baja with Makali or ranching, um, agriculture, that is what this rural community is founded around. So the curriculum and the academic projects, which vary from year to year, will focus on those types of topics, which the teachers and the students will decide together they want to engage in. And I think that's a little bit different than the standard block schedule, um, traditional six academic classes in, uh, in the regular system. So tell me about, you know, you mentioned your, your school, which now has beautiful buildings, mm -hmm. um, award-winning environmental buildings, I may add. Mm -hmm. um, but tell me about that transition. I mean, because when I was there, uh, some of your um, members that were, were about my age remember the time when you were living in tents. Oh, so yes. if you could describe that transition, because given the paucity of, of, of public support, that is state support for charter schools, it's really quite um, miraculous to go from tents uh, to mm -hmm. brick and mortar award-winning building. Yeah, that was huge. Um, so we were very lucky to get the Lalamilo University of Hawaii underutilized agriculture station when we first started in 2000. And there were Quonset Hut style agricultural tents and shipping containers. Um, that we were, we, which is where we began. We had a one year uh, permit to use and we stayed there for 10 years. Um, in the ninth or so year of the school, there was a hundred year flood that came through that facility. We were blessed that it happened during spring break, um, but it really, it literally took the vans to the back of the fence, flipped the porta potties over, um, and we had four feet of water in everything. So then we realized that we weren't willing to wait to raise the money to build the facility. And understanding that when a child comes to school, the place that greets them really gives them their worth. When you walk up to a place that is a tent that is 45 degrees and you're cold in the morning, it's quite different than walking up to a beautiful facility that honors the land and welcomes you in. So the community got together and decided no matter what, we were gonna make it happen. Um, we worked together with USDA um, and the Federal Department of Agriculture. Bank of Hawaii was huge um, and took out community debt with our partnering nonprofit and raised money through Kamehameha Schools and OHA and a bunch of other philanthropic supporters and have been building since 2008, very slowly and very consistently um, to try to honor a master plan that is actually a community place. And tell us a little bit about the environmentally award-winning mm -hmm. building and the, who was the architect there, because that's, that's really amazing also. Yeah, Francis Oda and Group 70 was the first building. Um, 
Olaco, we received a federal grant that was a green build grant uh, to start the planning. Um, we ended up getting green platinum. And if I'm correct, I think we were the first, even though we didn't tout it that well. Um, the building's amazing. The peaks of the roof line there, the, the mountains, um, it's solar, it's spacious, it's all renewable. Um, every bell and whistle that you want to talk about, we have. It was also very expensive. Um, so when we did the audit, we got two awards, Jack Lipman AIA Awards um, for the design, um, which Francis Soda was amazing and his team at helping us achieve. And it is the signature building. Um, when we first got the land, we are all gifted with DHHL Hawaiian Homestead land. We went to Kupuna of the community and their requests were that when you came to this space, you felt like you were in a Hawaiian place. It looked like a Hawaiian place. Hawaiian values were permeated everywhere, and it was all about every education of every of every type. So we really tried hard to honor those values, uh, which are really hard. Malama Aina and sustainability is very expensive when you build. So this building, we did the best we could. We paid the exorbitant prices. We did the uh, the green audit from California to get the title. But when we went to the other phases, we honored all of that intention, but we tried to go as sustainable and lean as possible. For example, air conditioning is a is a point for green. You know, we don't need air conditioning here in Wyoming, <laughs> to be honest. We, we were cool and the air is beautiful. And so we it, it was a it was a, a juggle to fit in the box, but I think fundamentally Malama Aina and taking care of the land is green building. And that's what we are. We are Malama Aina, we are people of the land. So it worked perfectly. And you can feel it when you come to this. You know, I was I was um laughing a bit and chuckling to myself when you mentioned the fact about you don't need air conditioning, because I remember being in some of your picos the first time coming out just the way I'm dressed right now with just yeah. an Aloha shirt. And I looked around and most of the adults and children had coats on and, and I said, mm -hmm. okay, I get it. I yeah. gotta get yeah, a little warmer here in Kamwala. Um, yeah. So you talked about, you know, um, the sort of traditional cultural values, Hawaiian cultural mm -hmm. values. And mm -hmm. um, how is that, uh, how does that run throughout your school, K through 12? I mean, how is it expressed um, in your curriculum, and a corollary to this is, I now know that you have an online program too. And if you mm -hmm. can talk about first the expression of cultural values in your curriculum, and second, how is that being done also with your online program? I think it's it's very simple, honestly. It's first of all, it's the the traditional values that every adult wants for their child. It's love, thankfulness, um, committing, striving for your best. Um, being in a family, right? So it's not anything that's rocket science. It based in what the way Hawaiian values were transmitted through the family. Um, but they are behavior expectations of everyone that comes here. And they start with the leadership of the school down to, not down, but across to the teachers and all the staff and are absolutely expected of all students and families. So Everybody's on the same page with behavior. I mean, when you describe aloha, there's a lot of variations in the way that people will express or define aloha. But when you are synergistically sitting in it together, um, you can feel it. The way that it is infused into the curriculum is through olalo no eau, is through our proverbs, is through language, is through relevant aina based curriculum that connects humans to the land, humans to creatures, humans to our history, humans to Hawaiian evolution. And all of those stories and mo'olelo, all of those histories and, and facts that our kupuna bring forward are grounded in those values and they are expected. So it, it isn't difficult because it is assumed that if you come here, you believe and you live those values. 
Does that make sense? It, it makes perfect sense. That means that you have sort of a code where um, with values, but from reading that code, you could be someone that's not familiar with the Hawaiian language and cultural values, but as long as you're willing to learn, mm -hmm. uh, you'll be accepted by and you know, welcomed, welcomed into the community, because I think that's also important for people to know. Absolutely, and, absolutely. And, and how is this expressed, you know, um, especially from talking to that wonderful teacher, Pua, in your mm -hmm. online community? Um, uh, because you seem to have students both in brick and mortar and online. Yes, I think the Hawaiian, um, Nicole Ryan, the principal for the Koloha program, our online program, Ampua, um, have done, it, and all of the staff have done an amazing job at connecting online curriculum to families. So it's an Ohana-centered learning style. Uh, a student that learns online really needs family engagement. You have to have a mentor or a human adult that is going to guide you um, through your curriculum because you're not coming to school every day. And you don't need, the, the co-op program offers um, a different style for those that are perhaps professional hula dancers in Japan or professional athletes like surfers, ranchers that have their own business. They're not going to have time or it doesn't fit their lifestyle to sit eight to three. So everything is incorporated through their individual family learning plan. Uh, the teachers work together with the family mentors to scope and sequence the curriculum. They have choices and the, the teachers have them flow with the family and the needs. As long as the students meet the academic benchmarks, and usually they exceed it, which is quite interesting, um, they they get as much freedom as they're as needed. Um, the projects themselves, and again, the staff, the day starts with people. Um, you're, you're grounding the students in culture and language. The behavior expectations, the projects themselves are all grounded in our mohololo, the language, the history of Hawaii. So again, the themes are all about Hawaiian and all about Hawaii. It doesn't prohibit them from exploring other things, but the basis of all the curriculum starts there and it is infused throughout. You know, this is really interesting because it seems like with your online program, you're doing what um, Arizona State has done with their online programs, you know, throughout the world. And 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 specifically what kind of tickles my fancy is at Starbucks, that any Starbucks employee can get mm -hmm. a, a bachelor's degree. And speaking yeah. of advanced degrees, many of your students seem, from what I saw, to have... Um, units already, uh, college units, various community yes. colleges. And I wondered if you could talk about that, because that, you know, sometimes when you have conservative educators, they say, okay, well, this is all well and fine, mm -hmm. and the culture is good, but, you know, can these kids get into college if they so choose? So, oh, absolutely. So let me let me stop and let you talk now. Um, we, we've focused for oh, a good 18 years on dual credit options for our students. It, it started with uh, the charters are not uh, were not allowed to participate in Upward Bound, which was a DOE dual credit option. Um, so we were always fundraising and our students paying tuition to try to bring in dual credit. Um, we got a grant maybe 15 years ago to create the Ali Bridge Program with UH West Oahu and Judy Oliveira. Um, and that really launched a lot of the partnerships that we have now with Hawaii Community College, Palama Nui, UH West Oahu, Windward. And they have graciously aligned their early education or beginner college readiness courses with our course catalog, as do Kanu's teachers. So for example, if our students are able to take Hawaiian Language 101 um, at the college level, there's no reason, and we have the partnership to make that happen, which benefits them economically and prepares them mentally and uh, emotionally for that kind of rigor, then why not give them the opportunity, especially if they don't have to pay for it? So it is a balance that the principals and the teachers need to ensure that the student is ready, but 
um, through many, many blessings and many, many people, most of our students that graduate will graduate with dual credit. This year, we actually have one student who will graduate with two associates from Winward before she graduates from high school. And it may seem like, you know, we're pushing them, but if they're ready and if they're interested and they have that EE or that fire to persevere, then we say let them go. And it has absolutely worked. Um, and the kids have absolutely been engaged and inspired to engage in post-secondary options because of the experiences that they've got while they're in high school. And I think that's one thing that I was remiss in, in sharing when we founded Kanu. We needed to change the attitude of five generations of people that have been disparaged from the public education system. So it's been a whole family effort to ensure that our people realize how interesting life can be the more educated you are, as long as you are following your path and what your desire is, if that makes sense. It, it does make sense. And what also is, is uh, very unique um, about your school is in the same way that um, the going back to the mid 19th century Lahaina Luna public school mm. um, and it was actually operating under the kingdom, um, they had you know grew their own crops and had their own mm -hmm. husbandry and you yes. seem to have that too and I I was laughing as one of the boys told me uh, when I was at your school that the that the process of the process was um, very interesting. Um, because they, he talked about the, the animals being processed. Yeah, I didn't realize what that was a euphemism for. Yeah, you know, coming you're know, thinking about um, mm. Wilbur uh, being eaten yeah. by the students, but <laughs> from Charlotte's Web. But anyway, yes, I, I, I yes. want you to talk about that. Uh, well, again, we're in a ranching community, and it is what the kids live. So, trying to ensure that our students that are on homestead lands, one, we bring in what is at home to school to make it relevant, but two, that they can apply that learning to the economics of their future so that we still have ranchers. Um, so we do have um, some aquaponics with some fishies and we have rabbits and chickens and ducks and we have a cow named Bobby Q because <laughs> Bobby Q will be processed. So we have pigs, um, some that are donated, some that show up on their own. We have chickens. We have a large population of nene goose that think they own the property um, because everybody's so respectful. So that whole um, bringing the, the creatures into the learning space is not only good for social emotional help and support, it's good to make school relevant to their lives. And since the onset of COVID, we have actually beefed up, <laughs> pardon the pun, I didn't mean that, but we have increased um, the number of creatures through our staff who have literally donated um, creatures to the school so that the, the children who need that um, respite and that support can go get it. One of the projects they're working on planning now for next year is the preschool babies will be going with the high school students that in an Olalo immersion setting uh, all around the, the creatures. And the older children will explore um, fields in early ed education while being with the babies who will get to be mentored by the older children in that immersion setting with the animals. So it's things like that um, that are really unique for a school of choice. Um, and again, things like that that are completely relevant to our community and the way our culture would have taught, which is through action and doing. You know, um, one of the things that I was aware of, because, you know, I, I read your WASP report, um, Kathy, was that while many public and charter schools scores drop um, mm -hmm. during, because you, you mentioned, uh, you know, COVID and the virus, mm -hmm. uh, but yours did not. Um, and I was wondering if that was because you, you, know, you guys were already equipped with online teaching and kids were used to it. Uh, 
Partially, I would say yes, because the online students didn't skip a beat. But for the campus crew and, and the staff and leadership, they really needed to, to um, shift gears to serve students. It was a huge community effort. We did everything from um, bringing in meat for families to get a box every month so they could eat because all of the food subsidies were denied um, to buying every student a computer, getting Wi-Fi units up to homestead community. Um, the teachers and the, the leadership, academic leadership of the school just worked really, really hard. And what was super interesting is the elementary children, it seemed that parents understood that they needed to engage or the kids were going to get lost. But the middle and high school students, um, it didn't seem that way. It was almost like parents thought, well, they've got enough skills to do it on their own. And we are still finding that uh, remediation, extra support, social emotional wellness, gap learning, it will be going on for a long time. So even though the scores didn't drop dramatically, and we attribute that to our great teachers and leadership, it, we still are struggling to come out of it and give students their leo again, give them their voice, because that's with the mask what seems to have been impacted the most. A child's confidence, their willingness to engage, and their willingness to look you in the eye and have that confidence. So I, I think we'll be pushing for that for a long time to get back where we're pre-COVID. Um, we have less than a minute left, and I want to, want to give the last word to you, but I did want to just mention that when I talk with students at your school, uh, you know, many, many of them had, you know, traditional career choices. They wanted to be a mm -hmm. doctor, a lawyer, et cetera. Uh, but some said, uh, two children said, one, I want to join the radio, and another said, I want to be a rancher. Just, mm -hmm. uh, but I want to give you the last remaining seconds to talk about anything you'd like to talk about. I think I, w I, I just want to show appreciation and, and be thankful, you know, that we are here. We've been here for 24 years. Um, we are one of the first charter schools, the first Hawaiian focused charter school. The investment that Hawaii has, has given us, it has paid off. We have learned. We have so much to share. Our options of school choice are so good for kids. Um, and we are willing to share with anybody and partner with anybody to make education better for Hawaii. And again, I know sometimes we're controversial as charters and people don't understand, but the impact has been absolutely amazing. And the empowerment for every child and adult, Hawaiian or not, is absolutely phenomenal. I am so honored to work with the people I work with. I am so honored to serve the community, to serve Hawaii, and I'm so excited for what our kids and our product is going to do for our future. Chief Business Officer at uh, Tanu Oka'aina on the big island of Hawaii, we thank you and a hui ho and aloha to everyone. And uh, thank you for joining History is Here to Help on Think Tech Hawaii. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.